Thanks a lot, and uh, many thanks to the uh, Manitoba Institute of Policy Research, um, David and all panelists. Uh, really pleased to be here this evening. Uh, unlike um, unlike uh, my fellow panelists, um, I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to uh, to a direct role in international education. Uh, however, I spent much of my career working uh, in a policy and funding role related to post-secondary education. Certainly, with uh, and witnessing the significant growth of international education uh, in the province of Manitoba and nationally over the past decade uh, to 15 years. So, uh, I, uh, I'm currently the Vice President of Academic at Manitoba Institute of Trades and Technology. I have responsibility for international programs at the Institute. We're formerly Winnipeg Technical College, and uh, in July 2014, uh, we received an exciting new mandate from the province of Manitoba. We retained our trades and technology focus, um, but we're also uh, given additional status to, uh, uh, to offer programs as a school division, um, uh, focused on technology education for uh, students across the province as well as additional um, status as a post-secondary institute of higher learning offering certificates and diplomas. We have significant growth strategy over the next five years, uh, and our primary areas of growth are high school and, not surprisingly, international education. So it's been timely for me to be speaking to you tonight about that. Before I jump into some more details about the international programs and strategies uh, at MITT, I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of international education, taking a broad perspective. I, I, my uh, uh, fellow panelists have touched on some of these points, so I'm going to skirt over some of the economic data. I don't need to repeat um, you know, the significant economic de benefit to GDP. Uh, in addition to the direct uh, expenditures of students, we also see that the families and friends of international students spend um, over $300 million annually coming to the country and supporting our uh, tourism industry, so there's related and ancillary benefits. Uh, as well, in, in the educational services sector, over 70,000 jobs, or 5.7% of the total number of jobs in that sector are directly attributable to international education. One of the key points, and this is certainly a point that we reflect on uh, daily uh, at MITT as we work with employers across the province, is uh, the important role that international students play in filling jobs in Canada post-graduation in key areas where there is labor market need, and that they come to the workplace and they come to employers with Canadian credentials, which are highly valued by employers in Canada. In Manitoba, uh, in terms of attraction, uh, the top three countries, uh, certainly for MITT, and I believe provincially, uh, is uh, China, India, and Korea at present. So obviously there are economic benefits. We view our international strategies as a balancing between economic benefits and internationalization, as uh, the other speakers have mentioned. Over 90% of higher education institutions in Canada have indicated that internationalization is a top institutional priority. In terms of uh, situating internationalization in context, uh, I'm just gonna read a quote to you from the Association of Universities and Colleges in Canada, which I, I, I really like and I think it, it situates it quite well. International student mobility is one of the cornerstones of the growing internationalization of Canadian universities. It encompasses both international students attending Canadian institutions and Canadian students going abroad for academic credit while registered at a Canadian institution. Both streams have a great impact on our universities and ultimately on society as a whole. Likewise, both present complex challenges to university officials and policymakers who share the goal of raising the levels of international student mobility. I can definitely relate to the benefits noted in this quote. Like Rhonda, I have a personal experience uh, with an internationalization initiative. In my early 20s, upon completion of my undergraduate education, I had the great fortune of uh, attending a Government of Canada internationalization initiative. I went overseas as a youth international intern employed by the Canadian International Development Agency. I spent close to a year working in, in South Africa in a research and institution building role. And uh, I, during that time was able to uh, experience the significant racial divide and a transforming a nascent democracy in the new uh, nation of South Africa. Uh, this impacted me personally in a very meaningful way um, and certainly changed my perspectives on uh, countries abroad, on international people coming from other parts of the world, and it certainly impacted my trajectory in life. So you know, my, my comment on, on that and certainly having been, been touched by internationalization efforts that are supported by government would be that I see the very similar benefits for the students that come, uh, that study at our institution, as well as for Canadian students that, that study abroad. 
Yet, while there are benefits to internationalization, there are challenges, and I, I, I don't want to jump too much into uh, repeating comments, but we do have uh, the, the balance issue, and, and I think that, that from a policy perspective, and, and as it relates to, to the Cafe Politique, is an important one. How, what should our balance point be between students coming into Canada versus students that are studying abroad, given that we have so few that go, that go out? I'm going to now focus on MITT's experience, and, and I think our experience is, is, is interesting and unique in the sense that uh, it is relatively new for our institution to have embraced an, an international education in a major way. From a standing start in 2009, we had less than 50 students, and we are now hosting over 400 annually. Keep in mind that MITT is a small institution, it is the smallest of the colleges in the province, and we, um, when we take all categories of students have only roughly over 2,000 full-time equivalents annually, so it's a significant number. We are also ad anticipating additional growth in this area of up to 300 over the next five years. International students represent roughly 19% of MITT's overall student population and 15% of students in our core programs. We offer spaces to international students in both our core programs, and we also offer dedicated cohorts exclusively for international students. The cohort programs have been important for MIT in that they have allowed us to grow faster, uh, or to grow, to grow at a fast rate while still maintaining our ministry funded spots for domestic students. Our institutional strategies are focused to align with the Canadian and, and Manitoba international education strategies. In terms of what we offer, um, we focus on applied technical, vocational and professional programs that meet current labour market demands. These programs vary uh, from millwright and electrical to network security and international business. Most of our programs meet eligibility for the Manitoba Provincial Nominees program, Programs Manitoba, uh, Manitoba Experience Stream. So we were able to achieve the significant growth in international students by promoting technical and applied learning overseas, promoting our short time to completion, and high post-graduation employment rates. A majority of the students that are studying at MITT indicate that they are interested in staying in Canada, and our recent indications are that most of these students go on to apply for residency. We have a dynamic and diverse population, but from an institutional perspective, we really have to focus constantly on enhancing what we're doing, uh, the work that we're doing to better serve our international student population. I'm going to touch a little bit on how, we, how, we, how we're currently doing that. So one of, the, one of the ways is by focusing uh, on student services and asking ourselves, are we cult cultur culturally sensitive? Some examples of recent initiatives would include our Culture Club Student Engagement Initiative. This is a, an opportunity that happens on a regular basis where we bring our international student population together. Uh, they get together for lunch, they spend time together to share their cultures, their Canadian experiences, and to discuss student life at MITT. We support our students through events, tours, and learning engagements so that they can learn about Manitoba and about the Canadian context in which, uh, which they've entered. We've had to ask ourselves about facilities. Do we offer accessible amenities to our students? MITT currently lacks a student residence, and this has been a major barrier for many students in terms of coming here. That being said, we've had to put additional effort into providing support to assist students in finding rental accommodation and homestays. We've also had to look at creating culturally safe spaces on our campuses. And this would include an example, would be uh, uh, setting aside a prayer room for our Muslim students. On the staffing side, the cross-cultural awareness and the level, uh, levels for our instructional, instructional and non-instructional staff have been paramount. Not everybody, and again, because this is a new experiment, we're five years in uh, to significant growth in international education, this has been a big learning curve for many of the staff at the Institute. This has created, resulted in a need for significant emphasis on professional development and institutional expenditures in this area. We've had to look at our financial aid programs. Uh, we've had to confront the myth that all international students can address all costs. Yes, it is true that to uh, receive a study permit, international students have to demonstrate financial means to come to Canada, but the reality is that we do see international students that uh, have to access food banks that have significant financial challenges while in study. So we've had to enhance our international bursaries and special aid to address uh, these demonstrated financial needs for students while in programs. And last but not least, we've had to place a strong emphasis and focus on quality assurance. 
are our students ready uh, to come into programming and to be successful? I uh, noted in some of my onboarding and reading that this has been one of the significant challenges in the Australian experiment, whereby uh, international students coming in uh, have uh, had significant barriers, and in some cases, institutions have responded in, in very different ways to, to that challenge. So at MITT, we've had to focus significantly on language and literacy testing and verification. We have run into a number of cases of fraud and have had to work hard and continue to work hard to increase resources to address these issues when they arise. We've also been investing in essential skills for our students, and this would include uh, concepts like the Culture Club that I mentioned, uh, focusing on literacy, numeracy, and other areas of essential skills. And our language training programs. We've had to bolt on front-end and language intensives for students before they can enter technical training to ensure that they're ready, as well as exploring pre-entry pathway language programming that will be delivered overseas uh, on behalf of MITT uh, so that students coming to us are ready. So now that I've touched a little bit on what we're doing at MITT, I want to close with a few public policy questions that I see related to international education in Manitoba and Canada. I'm going to focus on three. First being international student rights. What is the governing body for international uh, students in, in Manitoba? Uh, what is the governing framework? For example, Manitoba, and it was already mentioned by Gary, uh, passed the International Education Act in 2013. And in doing so, the province has uh, stated that it now provides the strongest consumer protections for students uh, in international students in Canada. What is the right balance? Traditionally, the policy guideline for post-secondary institutions has been roughly 20% of the student population being international. Is that balance still appropriate given the significant growth in internationalization? And what is the right overall growth target for Canada? What is the optimal balance for internationalization, economic, social, and cultural benefits for Canada, its institutions, and all the international students that come here? Thanks.